Oh, man. So how are things in Colorado? Oh, they're going okay. Yeah? We, sure. uh, we're going to do our sponsors meeting in like a few weeks, so preparing for that. Ugh. Oh, it's going pretty well, though. That's good. And you're now a married man. Yes, I am. Congratulations. Thanks. That was a, quite the project getting everything together for that. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, come on. I don't know. My, ca- my camera's got the green light on, so I don't know why I can't see you. Oh, okay. Can't see me. I think pro- probably screen share is going to be the way to go for this one. Yeah. yeah that's great. Cool. So how how are things on the on the programming front? <laughs> They're doing okay. Just I've been having a little bit of fun with it when I get time off. I start thinking about something like, oh, that would work or that's not gonna work, or thinking about random things. But it's going pretty good. We got some random stuff like I said thrown together. It's mostly trying to mimic what you guys have already as a few things, like it's not completely one to one yet for this tree mesh stuff, but like, at least I want to talk you guys through the logic that I had right now. Okay. That'd be great. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look through what I've written yet or not on that GitHub site or. Uh, and this is on your tree repo? Yeah. 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 No, I've looked it through a little bit. Um, so you're. So the idea is that it's a, it basically, since you guys are compiling stuff anyway, it's just using a C++ backend instead to do yeah. most of the heavy lifting and building the tree structure and everything. So it goes really quick. That's um, awesome. Would you mind giving us just like a bit of an a walkthrough? Or a yeah. Walk-through? yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. The screen share thing going. What do I have to do? Google Talk plugin, yes. It it is working. <laughs> yeah. Uh I just gonna see that. Okay, so you guys can see this? Yep. Yep. Okay, so the idea is that uh, Cython can be used to generate C++ files instead of C files. Mm -hmm. Um, It just allows a few more object-oriented stuff to interface with it. But the idea is that there's only one of everything so there's only one node at each location in space. There's only one edge at each location. Uh, which, I mean, the edges not really matter, but it's things aren't really referenced by what level they're at. Okay. They're just on their location. So the idea is that if you start thinking about a tree, it goes and does the recursive division of the cells, right? So if you have a, a cell, so I have this f- function here called build tree. And then you'd give it this the, f- t- the test function. So it starts initializes some nodes at the boundaries, like the four no- or the four or eight nodes in whatever dimension you're at. And then it recursively divides divides that cell. And it keeps track of the of its nodes and a and a big list of nodes. How how are you pointing the right? Oh. Oh, so, points are in the thing. Gotcha. I see. Right. So this is just C plus plus. Like, it's because this root cell is a a pointer to a cell object that you have to use the operation instead of a dot. A dot. Okay. Yeah. So if it gotcha. was, yeah, it's it's they're basically the same thing. It's just a matter of, because this is actually a pointer instead of an actual object. So it's just a pointer to an object. You have to use this. So 
anyway. Oh, okay. So I'm just calling this roots dot, divide. Dot divide. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So it divides and then it goes into these nodes. So I basically I keep passing the node list and the nodes are all stored in a map. So it's a like this the data structure basically where each thing is indexed by a specific key. So everything every node has a unique key based off of its position in space. And the way I handle that is through this little key function here. So what it is, is it's, have you heard of Cantor pairing? No, um, I have not. So every, it's a, it's a function that given a, like two integers produces a unique integer. So every combination of two integers has a unique, has one unique output. Cool. Hmm. So it, even if, if X is zero and Y would be one, that would give you a different output than if X was one and Y was zero. Yeah, that's okay, cool. that's cool. So the idea so is that every, right, every, and the same thing applies to 3D, it's just applying it twice. Um, so that's how I kind of keep track of which nodes have been created and which nodes are need to be recreated. Yep. So you go into a cell and it's, it starts dividing stuff. So this is just a bunch of logic here that's, telling it whether or not it needs to divide itself. And if it does, then it creates its children. And then it balances everything as it's being created if you wanted it to. Okay. Um, basically, the, the logic here is that if, so each cell also knows which neighbors it's around. So it, in 2D, a cell would have four neighbors. In 3D, it has eight neighbors. And it just looks through all of its neighbor cells. And the thought here is that, okay, if I need, if my, if this a certain cell needs to be divided, and then if it's, if I, I need to be divided and my neighbor is a level above me or a level or two level levels below me. Yeah. So if either way, if it's a level below me or above me, whichever way it means it's less or it's more coarse than I am. And I need to be divided. Then it need it also needs to be divided for balancing. So I just go through, and then it forces that neighbor to divide itself. Okay. And then this is just a bunch of logic with setting neighbors. Here. So the key here is this this spawn function, which creates the children. So given the nodes, it creates children. Are you doing that with edges and faces as well? Are those uh, at, not at, not necessarily at the same time. It's easier to keep track of those later. Okay. So once it goes through all the cells, <coughs> once it creates all the cells, it goes and then okay, and then it draws all the edges essentially, edges and faces. But it's easier. To, so this is the function that's kind of doing that work. Like I said, if it, I, I find the centers and corner points of the new cells that are going to be created in a certain order. And, and then I taking track of uh, the tensor, like a tensor octree, or is it only? So it's just keeping track of like which cell, and then uh, the the nodes surrounding the cell, the nodes that make up that cell, and so then it it looks at the a list of nodes. So this is this node map, and this set default node is going to is going to same thing. It looks through the node map based off of the key of the cell that of the node that would be created here. If that key is already in the node list, so it grabs that key and assigns and returns that point. If that key is not in the node list, it creates a new node and stores that in the node list and then returns that point. Okay. So that's like that's how it stops itself from creating things that are already in the same location. It ensures that there's only one unique node at each location in space. So I guess um, in, in terms of like zooming back a tiny bit from this, are you, so my understanding of this is you start with a single cell and then you can divide 
it into a tree. Is that correct? Right. So are you, yeah. I guess how I was, how I did my implementation was starting with sort of a tensor mesh of uh, like root cells, um, okay. as well as have sort of the base tensor mesh so that you could actually change the, the, the widths of like the H spacing on each piece. So it's like a, it's, I'm, I haven't gotten a, to that. A, a, yeah, it's a, a tensor, like a, yeah, a tensor right. tree. Right, so um, each it's like separate widths. Each yeah. cell would have separate widths, yeah. yeah. Uh, I haven't gotten to that part yet. It's more so just an over, I know how I would, how I would do it because, and everything here is just unit width. Yeah. This whole thing is set yeah. up as unit width, right? So you just have that on the outside. Yeah, on the out yeah, okay. on the outside, it just would go through and figure out what it needs to do. Yeah. Okay, so this this is just the tree structure that you're. Yeah, doing. I mean, you could even like spin these up if you wanted to for. Uh, mul like if you started with a base or like a the coarsest level mesh of like mm -hmm. that's like ten by ten or something, then you could use one of these in each one of those potentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe I don't know. Then you're yeah, you should be able to. Be able to. On that boundary I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the idea, though. Yeah. yeah um, cool. But that's kind of like it creates all the nodes like that, and then it assigns those nodes to the new cells. And there, you got your four children or your eight children, however many you need. Um, so after it goes through that whole recursive thing of calling everybody and building the whole tree itself, uh, it goes through an ascent. Then it has to go through and generate all the faces, edges, and you do that just by looping through all of the leaf cells. So it, once you go through all, once you build all the cells, you can loop through the tree and figure out which ones don't have any children, and those are all leaf cells. So you, is what? What about like the shared faces? Is that taken care of by the same key structure? Yeah, so the shared edges and key faces are all are taken care care of by that same kind of map key structure thing. Okay. So that it only ensures that unique faces are created. Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah. So and, it just goes, and and you're doing that at the end just because it's easier to. Yeah, think. it's easier to think about instead of just kind of doing it all at once. I mean, you could do it all at once at the same time, yeah. but and there's no reason to just build a bunch of edges that you don't need or. So is that it's like, like you're always I, so why, every why node you, that gets created. Why did you do nodes then at that? So every node that gets created will always be a node. Like there's so however, however many times you split up a cell, it's not going to create any nodes that aren't going to be used. I gotcha. Okay. That's fair. Right. Yeah. Whereas edges, could, that's not. edges yeah. and faces. Yeah, it could create edges and faces that are not being used. So I'll just do it afterwards. Because otherwise, you have cool. to keep track of. Okay, I'm going to get split. So do I need to get rid of my edge? Is it going to get hanging at the end of the time? Yeah. Or right, because sometimes you need to leave the edge if it gets split. But sometimes you don't. That's so it's cool. easier just to do a, think about it afterwards. So you can loop through. Here. Can loop through uh, all of the edges, or all of the cells. Like I said, build each cell's edges and faces. Is this in this one's in two D? Do you? This one is in three D, I believe. Oh, that that one's in three D. Okay, cool. So, right there's eight or twelve. Yeah, twelve, 12 edges, edges yeah. and six faces. Yeah. Um. And then each face also, and then I assign the edges to each face. Yeah. Nice. So all all the edges, all the edges will know their points that bound them, and all the faces know the edges and the points. Hmm. So it just it's just kind of a way to like keep track of like okay, well if I need to, which I'll show you later if if you need to do like the edge curl or the yeah. face curl. Yep. Or edge curl thing, right? Just loop over all your faces and then go through the edges. And then it's kind of 
after that point, so then I'm also keeping track, track of how many times each face is referenced. So how many cells each face is, is on. And to do that, that's just because it's easier to think about hanging faces that way. So if a face has two, is part of two cells, mm -hmm. like if one face is part of two cells, then it is not a hanging face. Yep. So, right, if it shares all four points. Very cool. So yeah. you can, however, so then it leads, the only, so the only faces that are not hanging are either on the boundary of the objects or of the mesh, or if there's a parent face with its children faces. So it's easy to identify the parent faces because they have a node at their center. Right. Mm -hmm. So cool. you can just, yeah, what's, okay, what's, have what's, your, what's your indexing? Or like, what are your integers on the, uh, what, Cantor pairing? Cantor pairing? Yeah. What, what are those? Yeah. Um, it's just, it's the size type. So the size, the maximum size of a integer, it's the, uh, the type of integer that C++ will use to index arrays on your machine. Oh, I guess more sort so of conceptually like, rather. Oh, it's just, so it, it's their location in space. So if any, it's, so it'll be, so the node at the origin would have zero, zero, zero. And then however wide, however big the mesh is or how the maximum level to it. Okay, so you're that defining defines, that up front, yeah. I guess. Yeah, so the max level, it's just however many it can. So okay, if the max level is eight, right, the maximum value would be like 512 or something like that. Gotcha, okay, very cool. So we are, we're thinking about a base mesh in setting those up rather than doing like the Z curve kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not even concerned about the ordering of anything right now. Okay. Yeah. Because like, because every cell knows what's like, which things bound it. Every edge knows which points are around it or which points bound it. It's, I don't really need to keep track of the index particularly. As, um, as long anyway. as. Well, as long as you can know, as long as you have one that doesn't change, <laughs> that, yeah, that's good. Yeah, right. So the the idea is, I go through and I process. I find all the hanging x faces, y faces, z faces. At the same point, I can find the hanging edges and hanging nodes on each face. So that's what just a bunch of this. That's all. What this logic is just kind of identifying the hanging faces and points and edges. That's cool. So then after you found all of them, then I can, after that, I go through and number them. So each, each of those objects has a, each node will know its index. Every edge will know its index. And that's how I keep track of the indexing of it. It's like, I'm not really concerned of what order they get indexed as long as each node knows its index. Yep then it doesn't really like I th what ends up hap hap what ends up happening is the cells do get numbered in that same z order just because of how they are created okay. that you they're in just because the order that it gets looped through and that recursive division will will create them in the same order that the z curve would create them in but as far as the nodes and cells or as far as the nodes and edges they are essentially numbered in whatever this key, whatever order this key function puts them in, because the map itself is the node, like the list of nodes, is ordered in that key function, ordered by that key function. Okay. What makes it fast is that map object is has a very fast lookup, so it's easy to tell if something is in the node or in the map or to get that object out of the map. Gotcha. So that's just kind of the thinking about how it happens on the back end of it. And so then, when, when I, so my like first attempt at implementing the Octree, I did exactly the same thing as uh -huh. you did here actually with like creating classes uh, yeah. in Python though. <laughs> And so yeah. I, I ran into all sorts of memory issues. 
um, with having objects wrapped around each cell um, and each edge and each node. And that, did, so do you run into any of that stuff? I haven't seen anything about that yet. Cause I mean, it's just, they're all storing pointers to themselves. So it's, it adds a little bit, I think it does add more storage. So if you see this, so in the header file kind of gives you an idea of what each thing has. So each node will have its location, its key, the amount of times it's referenced by an object or by a cell its index, whether or not it's hanging, and then a pointer to each of its four parents. So I, I wasn't haven't really run into any issues with memory on anything that I've been running with. What, what how, how big are you making the meshes? Or like how many depth, I guess, or stuff like I that? I haven't tried it yet. So I mean I haven't tried to max it out yet. It so this would so I'm pretty sure like this your the this tree mesh isn't even gonna finish in a reasonable amount of time. Are you running it? Is that what's happening? Yeah. So that, see, I ran one that had, that ended up creating 323,000 cells in seven and a, like 7.3 seconds. So in SimPeg, I think that probably would have taken like longer, <laughs> <laughs> like six minutes, yeah. I think. So, I mean, I haven't, pushed up too high. So I mean, how high do you how high do they need to go, right? Like Yeah. at what point were you yeah. running them anyway use when you were doing it? Uh so so I think the problem was is that Python classes take up a bunch of space. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's that's sort of where the issue was, I, I'd have to look into it again, but that's when I was like learning about slots in Python classes so that you can <laughs> cut down on like the dictionary stuff and oh, it, yeah. it, it just like wasn't the right way to go. And yeah, and these um, are these are more like, like structures or C style structures. So they're not too <clears throat> heavy on sort of memory footprint as compared to like a Python class. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I, I guess um, that that would be my only concern on this. Um, and if it, you're not running into it, then I, mean, I haven't. Seen, it hasn't been an issue yet for me. So yeah. I, I got really disappointed because I did all of this stuff, and then I like started to scale it, <laughs> and like yeah. it just like completely broke <laughs> uh, based on the the memory yeah. stuff. I just got one that was like. I just ran one that took about a minute to do on mine. That was. Did you 200. track your memory at all? No, I mean, it okay. wasn't. Still took like what, two, two and a half million cells. I didn't run into any memory issues or anything like that. And that's that's doing the, the numbering, which is all of the, uh, the creating hanging facing hanging nodes, the edges, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, it's right. doing everything there. Just building the whole tree and numbering everything. And Very so cool. um, then the idea, right, is you can interface with that, this whole class in Cython using C++ stuff. And you have to create a C-defined class that kind of wraps the Python or the C tree, like the C++ mm -hmm. tree. Um, you can never access anything from the tree itself directly from like the underlying C tree directly from Python because it just doesn't know what to do with it. Mm. So you would have to create uh, functions in this C defined class that would access some of those things. 
but it's still pretty quick because you can it most of it you can optimize down to C code with Cython pretty pretty simply. And this is where I've kind of been trying to mimic what I've had, what you guys have had going so far, at least for the uniform tree. I haven't played with it too much, but this is kind of the idea. Um, and so you're doing the operation constructing out in yeah, in Cython. In Cython, interesting. Yeah, because I need to know I need to have access to those C to objects. The, yeah, of course, of course. So I have to do so here. Um, this is so this is the face divergent operator in 3D. Yep. So I just loop through the cells, the cell list, and Cython actually makes this really nice because. If if you're doing it in C plus plus, so this C plus this is a a list a C plus plus vector. This object here is a C plus plus vector, and Cython knows how to get the correct object out of it, so you can kind of loop through it like you would with a normal, like mm -hmm. a C a list for from Python, right? So it'll just go and get through all the cells. So I go through the cell, I get the list of faces from each of the cells, or from that cell and the cell's index. And then just assign the correct indexes and assign the correct value. Is in cell dot volume that's coming? Oh, it, and then the calculate this, inside. The yeah, scale it's actually, is is on the right. outside. Right. See, so that's where you could bring into the the H the H stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. like so I just haven't done that yet, but yeah. Right, so you get the volume and the face areas, and then you can just assign them to them. So I don't have to worry about, so this is just creating the face divergence thing, and then, where do I do it? And then I, you still have to deflate the faces, right? Let me show you how that works. I don't have this in any sort of order that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you, so go through and deflate X faces, okay? So I'm just going to loop through my faces x, which are in a a map, a C++ map. So I have an iterator that goes through it, and the face is the second value of that iterator. Just C++ stuff. So again, I get the face index. So if the face is hanging, then it has a then I assign it uh, then it has a parent index. So the out the Essentially, the i i vector is the output index. The j vector would be the input index. So whichever, so this cell would be, the, or this face would be the not hanging face, right? Or else it's just itself. And then you have a value there. So it's just, it's kind of easy to determine if it's hanging or not. And it's kind of makes these things pretty simple to understand, I think. Yep. Um, the edges, so that you kind of do the same thing with the, let's see, where was I getting here? Did I finish this one yet? I don't think so. So and you're doing a cell no. grad as well? I, I was getting to it. I wasn't, <laughs> I was playing around with it. I don't think I finished that one yet. Um, so you can, so a nodal gradient, right? The nodal, nodal gradient X on, it goes from nodes to edges, right? So just loop through the edges and keep track of the edge points, edge point indexes, and do the operation. And points are nodes, is that right? Yeah, nodes. That's what I'm, <laughs> I mean. It's not too clean. Like I said, it's just I'll kind of it. something that kind of goes through it, right? So you just keep, and it's allocating all this stuff ahead of time. So these things get created pretty quickly. Not, not to mention the fact that it's most, like this is all a C. This optimizes okay. down to C++ stuff, so there's no Python calls in here. Uh, but yeah, like those are the values for the index, right? It's one over the length. And then yeah, are you doing the, the deflation stuff on this? Yeah. Later, yeah. So after you go through all that, then you got to deflate the deflate the nodes. So this is kind of the same kind of thinking goes goes here, right? Loop through all the nodes. If it's a hanging node, then it, you need to give it the index of its parents. So in 4D, in 3D, you can have a maximum of four parents. If it's 
on the edge or if it's on the center of one of those hanging faces or parent faces. Um, in 2D, I just had it assign the same parent twice or if it's only supposed to have two parents, then the second, like parent three and parent four are just the first two parents repeated. That way it's just the same function works for both 2D and 3D in every case. Okay. So the idea here is that sometimes the way that the parents are assigned to nodes is that if the node was, it's it's basically on based off the edges. So if the node would be on a parent of a hanging edge, so if it would be it would get those two parents for that node. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so what, what could happen though is that some of these parents could also be hanging, especially in 3D that can happen, or if it's not balanced, right. some of these parents could also be hanging. So instead of, I was thinking about that for a while and I was trying to think about how to like logic that out and think about things until I realized that you can just keep applying the deflation rates to itself. Wait, what? Yeah. I'm confused. So if some of these parents are hanging, the idea of the deflation matrix is to get rid of the hanging objects, right? Yep. So the hanging matrix, especially the way they have it ordered, it's an identity matrix for all of the hanging nodes, right? And then it's averages for all of the, it's, huh. hang, it's identity for all the non-hanging nodes. And then for all the hanging nodes, it's an averaging matrix between yeah. multiple nodes. So if you keep applying it to itself, it, it will eventually get rid of all of the hanging nodes to where it'll just go down to the right, like the size you need, it will. So even though <laughs> you do this to itself, it'll just keep like, even though these are, some of these can be hanging this operation. Right. So if it's well, one of the hanging nodes, it'll realize that, Oh, that op it, when you do that matrix matrix multiplication, it'll get, it would it'll just figure it out. assign that nodes parents. Right. Yeah. And the averaging the correct numbers and everything and apply it through. Huh. That's clever. And then you just do that until you get the right size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, so very it's just cool. kind of like, I, I was like doing all this logic, like, wait, I think I can just do it that way. Yeah. And so, so it I, does actually work? Yeah. Yeah. OK. That's the, that's <laughs> also nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I just felt like that got rid of a lot of the logic that I was trying to think about to like, Go through here and assign parents that are not hanging and yeah it's so screw it so you do it once and then it just like figures it out over time right yeah because so it, this it assigns the relationship between all the nodes here yeah and then it just keeps reducing itself until it gets to what it needs to be hmm. um yeah and then the edge curl kind of the same thing so Edge curl acts from edges to faces, so loop through all the faces. And then you're doing the same deflating of the edges. Yeah. Yep. So the edges get deflated the same. So and do you you you, you have to deflate edges and nodes on that one? Is there you doing like a nope. transpose? I don't need there. to. So the idea here is that um, you kind of see it on the same thing with the nodes as well. So the nodal gradient. It just because every edge knows whether or not it's hanging, I can skip over the hanging edges. Okay. So you're just not including them. Right. That makes sense. Right. Because it's like, why? I mean, we don't need to do them anyway. So just, yeah, just skip over them. Got it. And you okay, just so, skip them. so that's, that's why we, I guess. And there was some weirdness on our side of things because you don't actually want the same deflation matrix. Yeah. Like I thought it was the transpose on the other side. 
to mm. like you do the deflation on one side of the matrix and sort of a transpose right. of it on the other, except it's not actually a transpose because it's just to delete these things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're uh, doing it better. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, nice. it's like, why it's like why even like just not do them right yeah yeah, yeah. and the key the key is that the end like the way the faces are indexed and the nodes and the edges every way everything's indexed the non-hanging objects are indexed first and then all the hanging objects are indexed oh shit so it's okay so all the hanging stuff is at the bottom of the matrix. Exactly. And so you just never get there. Right. Wow. Okay. So that's another reason that we were having trouble with that is because our those right, were sort were. of in, interspersed. Right. And so it, you couldn't really do that. Yeah. So that's huh. basically how that how I got around. I mean, just number those guys first and not worry about it later. Huh. Oh. Yeah, and then you can just create all the average averaging operations, which are pretty similar to how you would create them anyway. It's yeah. the same kind of thinking, right? Faces to cell centers. Okay, loop through the cells and average the values from the faces around that cell. Or, yeah. Sure. I haven't gone through and create all of the averaging <laughs> operations and a few other things. The node, the node interpolation is easy. Yeah. Because you can just find you get the whatever location you want and figure out which cell it's in and then average those nodes around that cell or get the proper linear interpolated weights from those cells so you can do in your interpolation matrix pretty easily I yeah guess. at least for the nodes like the nodal yeah. interpretation interpolation one is easy the other ones i'm like i because you have to start dealing with if you start interpolating from like cell centers and you're like, okay, well, what's the nearest cell centers to this object that so you can think about it for a while, then could you could just, I mean, why, why couldn't you just have sci-fi do a triangulation of everything and then just use that, right? Like, I mean, is it really that much of a difference whether or not it's bilinear yeah. or linear? Yeah. So in, This is just an example for 2D. Is that a problem? Sorry, Ron, you cut out there, I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry, for your cell grad, you're, you'd have to think about that problem as well in terms of like, because that, that does matter. Um, right, but like I mean, you, you can still. a big cell next to a. Yeah, but you can still just construct it the same way that you guys would anyway, right? Like you can do the divergence operator and transpose that. And, like, there's no reason that doesn't work. Oh yeah, for sure. For so for the weak form stuff, I guess like the way we've been thinking about cell grad. So all of the EM codes don't actually use cell grad at all, as far right. as I know. Lindsay, you can maybe correct me there. No, they don't, unless you're using it in regularization. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. forward simulation does not. So the the cell grad, I guess, is more of like a finite difference operator sort of mm. um, right although so go ahead uh for dc we could use it we've been yeah. using the nodal grad but we could give it a try um yeah i mean is there any reason why it wouldn't just work to do like like you have like the divergence operator transpose thing it's i don't know um yeah you, you can you can definitely do it that way uh yeah i mean it's it's sort of up to interpretation of your of mm -hmm. how you actually want to think about it um i know that Eldad wrote a paper at one point looking at the um at the cell grad and actually like figuring out like when you have a big cell next to two small cells you can do some weighting be between those two things to actually do a cell difference or the uh, whatever your your finite difference over that and to mm -hmm. actually make your make your thing end up in the middle on the right face because like the way i was kind of thinking about it was that i 
it's like where is the operation it the operation is happening on the whatever like that parent face right like yep. the face between the two different cells yeah so it's like is it do you just average all four of the cells that would be on one side of the face and then do the difference between that and the other one yeah and this is where it also uh like if you're especially if your cells are not the exact same size mm -hmm. then it also uh matters <laughs> right <laughs> obviously um and yeah i don't know i'd have to look look some stuff up there um but i i know that, that and I, I hadn't tricky. i hadn't thought too much about it because i was mostly just concerned with mimicking what you guys had already had in there as far as the first pass type thing yeah so i wasn't too concerned about it yeah i never got to the cell grad side of things um i know that uh dom i believe implemented a stencil for regularization where you don't care if it's order two or whatever right um i think i saw that too it looked like he was doing that like just the transpose of the divergence operator yeah exactly type. Exactly. That's essentially, that's the logic behind it. Awesome. And I guess you guys can't really see the other objects, can you? Hold on. For some of these, like, I, I can't even, like, I barely have time to wait for any. I was just doing a bunch of comparisons between the two when I was trying to work everything out. I mean, it, it's it's still not quite the same as what you guys have. Like I said, like you need to work out all. I need to work out all those H things, but oh, right. yeah, the yeah. general structure is pretty close to what I think you would want. That's super cool. This is great. Whoa, what's Lex sort? Oh my god. Is that just uh, oh, a thing? This? Yeah. So this yeah, this sorts all this sorts those points based off of uh, right, Z Y X. Uh, and that's the that's order of it. I wrote my oh. own. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sad. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where was I getting that? Screen share. That's where it's going. That's so cool. So that was so. <clears throat> So this was for what I just changed up there, like it was 32. So it took that took it that long to build it with the implementation that I'd had. And then five seconds for what was in discretize. Mm -hmm. And if I bump it up a factor, so right now that end cell, NC was at 32, 64. Point seven seconds, and then it's going to take like 35 seconds or something. But this is also <laughs> so this here, was, this here was testing all to make sure that the all the norms were the same. That it was doing this, that I was doing the same operation between the two cells and that it was consistent, right? So comes up with the same grids for everybody. So, um, so what are you taking the norm on? Um, those, so it's the same operations that you guys had as testing functions for the discretized operators. Uh, okay. okay, cool. It's the same thing. So right now, like it did that, and this is the time it takes for that to build that object, right? Yeah. For the tree mesh. Yeah. Those sorry, those are the times. This is no, that's the 
those are the the that. norms, the difference. But you could yeah. you could basically see the difference in time between the yeah yeah between how long it took to construct those things, which is probably which is mostly I would assume fact of how they're getting built in discrete areas because they're it's not allocated ahead of time, right? Yeah, and it's, and mo it's mostly because it's not certain. allocated. Yeah, yeah. So that's super cool. Um, but yeah, see, it comes with the same number of nodes, number of edges, faces. The number of hanging nodes is different because, like I said, there's only one hanging node, or there's only one node at each location. Yep. Um, the nut, but the total number of edges and faces are always the same. Um, I do run up with a few, run into a few issues on the discretized side. So I don't think you can see what I just did, right? Because you can just see my, you can just see this yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Um, so I, which I'm not sure if I'm doing it correctly anyway. Yeah, we're back. So this was this, right? This is what this function was doing beforehand. So if I change this to two, Right now, this my tree is just getting built automatically balanced. So it balances everything. And then I'm pretty sure I've got things. I mean, do I need to do anything else to the discretized tree to make sure it's balanced? Uh, is there a balance function specifically? I don't remember. But you see how this function would, would want it to be balanced, right? Like it's going to have yeah. levels that are two different levels. Um, I don't remember if there's a balanced. Yeah, there is a self dot balance, which might be that might help me worth worth calling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, self dot balance. Oh, not sure where it needs to go, but. Uh, it's just a good the spot. Yeah. yeah, somewhere after after refine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it, hopefully it won't break on me this time. Make it smaller. Oh, it well, one is broken. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> what did I change? It was working. I don't know what changed. Okay. Hey, anyway, I was running issues. Let's see if it. I'll just skip mine for now because I'm not really quite sure what changed. It used to work. Um, what else could be on into issues?
this. It's been giving me this. Is this on, oh, this is on our side. Yeah. And I, I haven't had time to go through and figure out why it was doing this because I'm not, I don't know as much about how you guys were indexing things, but. It's something about. But it only happens when it needs to be balanced. Hmm. I have no idea. Yeah. Anyway. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. and the mesh construction side of things hasn't really been hit yeah, on. That hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it's it's more like loaded up from a UBC. Yeah. Um, side of things which is already balanced mm -hmm. um, right so, so we, we is, could maybe maybe give you some examples from that side yeah that would probably be good um it's because i don't know every like i can only try to mimic certain things and what you guys have in there uh yeah at least mimic like implementation things and so i i got a few questions how, you, how often okay. how often do things get like do individual cells get refined and coarsened as part of usage of the tree mesh? I think probably only at the start. Does that make sense of like- So like it's only ever, so you ever call like refine and then you give it a function and then you just use it like that? Yeah. Or yeah, so it's, how often it's do not, you coarsen no. cells? Uh, I don't think we've ever done that. <laughs> not in practice at least. Right. So it's like, is there much use in having that? Probably not. Because if it's because like know, refining individual cells is easy enough. Coarsening takes, I can do it. I know how I would do it. It's just a matter of like looping through that tree structure again and yeah, or yeah, going yeah. through it and, you know, removing the nodes that are no longer needed, which is why I was doing it at that point. I'm kind of counting the references to each node when they're getting built. So that way, if it, if we did have to course in it, it would decrement the references. And if they get to zero, then just delete that node and move on. Yep. But yeah. But I'm just kind of curious, uh, like how often they were called. <laughs> so I don't think we've ever done that. Like what I was thinking there is if you're like, uh, well, like, I was thinking about the octree for use in like float simulations where you're maybe tracking, like refining around an area of interest mm -hmm. and that area of interest is changing. Um, and so using the same mesh for that. Mm -hmm. So right, and that, the whole... that, was, that was the thinking, um, but right. we haven't actually done any of that. And honestly, refining is not that is easy to do because right, you would just go to, you'd get the cell and then mm -hmm. you would call you'd call divide on it and give it the new function that you want to use or if you want to right that's not too that's easy to do and then you just basically rebuild all the edges and faces which doesn't take very long yeah no i think that's probably good enough because especially if you're doing it that fast uh, yeah. Like if if the construction takes that fast and you need to change your mesh, which in geophysical applications isn't all that often, mm -hmm. um, you can just create it again, right? With it, with a new function. Yeah, and even if you see like a region you want to course in, just going in and redefining how you construct it, I think is actually probably easier, anyways. Like conceptually mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what else was I gonna ask? So refine course and and then I guess that was the thing was that. So are they always built in like powers of two? Um. So yeah, this I mean, this like, is this is where our like that sort of higher level base mesh, which could have some tree meshes inside it. Mm -hmm. uh, does that kind of make sense? Is like you have like a three by two top level mesh, and then each one of those is getting defined. Right. 
so then, but then, but each of those is always a factor of two kind of thing. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Except, I get that. except at some level, you could like not like be like you 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 have sort of a base coarse mesh mm -hmm. um, that you're then refining into a tree. Or does that make sense? Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Cool. One of the assumptions that I think we have baked in right now is that actually all the dimensions are the same. Yeah, so that's not actually the case, and that's something that people were annoyed about. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. And and the idea, I think I know how I would do that, uh, where it's not like that, where it's just it's a multiple cells, I guess, multiple node or root cells, right? You can just essentially pass it each when you build each of them you give each of them the same node map so it just keeps appending to that same node map if that makes sense that way you don't yeah. have like the it takes care of the insides oh, I and see. so you're yeah. sharing that node map between these multiple tree structures right you could share them between so right now i have it Right now, it's just really simple. Is there's one tree structure, okay, yeah. and it yeah. starts with one root cell. There's yeah. no reason I would have to say I'd have to do one root cell. Yeah, I could have multiple root cells. Yeah, which is would be how you would do that thing, right? And then yeah, yeah, yeah. just give it the same point list and go through everything like that. And then the edges would have to share between those as well. Right, but they, they would naturally do that because. It also creates a list. You could just loop through all the roots and get all of, all of the cells, all the cell vectors, and then do the same operation. Like this would not change at that point. So is the edge edge list is based on the node list? The edge list is based off of the cell list. Except how would you know that you're hanging between between different uh, root cells, hmm. or balanced between different right. root cells. Right, I haven't thought about that one yet. So the balancing between different root cells would be interesting. That'd have probably have to be something done afterwards. Okay, but actually, I don't think it would. No, it wouldn't, because I could just so each cell knows its neighbors. Right. Oh, so you put that in there. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. And then it would and automatically it just, do that. Yeah. It so happens to be a totally different thing. Yep. That's totally cool. <clears throat> yeah. So that's how I would handle that. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of fun. And that, that also means that you can do non, um, like it doesn't even have to be in a, uh, uh, Cartesian, or like it doesn't actually have to be in a grid. So you could like have an L shaped thing, which is actually really, really cool. Yeah, you caught, yeah. And as so long like as you can, like if you get these, uh, yeah, if you got the neighbors and everybody set up correctly, right? And that L shaped mesh. Yeah. Yeah. And so that also means that because you're dealing with the grid on the outside, like this is logically rectangular. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what you're doing, and you can actually bring the grid stuff in on, say, the Python side, mm -hmm. um, and actually do your well. If if you wanted, actually give it like where it is in space, so you could do um, like stitch it that way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. So yeah. so like in in the cylindrical mesh side of things, for example. Um, this could actually be used for that. That'd be super cool. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they 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 still just have four neighbors in that, or eight neighbors or whatever in the cylindrical mesh. Yeah. Like it's still logically rectangular, right? Like, yeah, has the same number of bounds and whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's just that there's some boundary conditions and, like, on the uh, innermost. Uh, thing yeah, doesn't have, right. have a have a have a neighbor like it 
is its center. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like there's there's a no no boundary condition or no flow boundary mm -hmm. condition basically on the inside of the center cell. Um, and then the lengths and uh, areas are different, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but otherwise, that's exactly it, the same. Right. If you think about like on the cylindrical cell, right? You could have the you could have it wrap around on itself in terms of the neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, which is actually another cool point there, is you can potentially, like, I'll send you a, uh, what is it called, the P forest? Oops. I'll send you a uh, image. Um, there's a cool thing on uh, where are you guys? Slack. That's good. Where it's a parallel forest of trees, which is basically what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then they like are connecting all of these different parallel forests up together um, to do like they've done it in a sphere oh, of different yeah. blocks of things, um, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow. Yeah, no, that's good. Cool. But, yeah, I'm just kind of trying to think of, trying to get an idea of what you guys needed out of it and make sure it wasn't something too bad or... No, I think this is <laughs> it's awesome. close. <laughs> so this is really exciting, Joe. Yeah, I wonder, Lindsay, if you get Mike to send through an example box tree mesh that, because I, I think another piece here is the loading functions into, of like loading up an existing yeah right structure and saving it. So like the way that the box tree works at the moment is it just or it could just save the Z uh, index or Z mm -hmm. tree or Z order curve of cell indices, which I think you could do as well with your function because they're unique as long as you know your spacing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think some some thought on like how to serialize yeah, you could just, it. Right, you could just, so you could, uh, yeah, because I'm not really quite sure how you would serialize the or if you can like serialize the C object behind it, right? Yeah. Because all the stores I, it just stores a pointer to literally the the C or the Scyth the Scython class just stores a pointer to the tree or the C hmm. tree. So I'm not yeah. really quite sure how you would serialize it then. So yeah, because I, mean, I if you if you just serialize the indices of the cells so that you could go through it at some later date and just refine it again. Yeah, maybe. Or what might work better is to serialize that key index. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's unique. It's a unique function that goes between the two, right? Yeah. So you can always get it. You can always get the integers back, the two integers back out if you give it a single value. Oh, you can. That's cool. Yeah. Because it's a unique mapping from one to the other. Right, okay. Yeah, I found that function. I'm like, this will work. Because I was, I was first trying to think about it in Python. And if you give it pairs of things, it just, like Python will just, uh, if you give it a, a tuple, like it as a key, it'll serialize that tuple somehow and make it unique. And I hmm. wasn't really quite sure how Python was doing it. And I just, was looking around and things, and I found this guy, uh, that canter pairing function. I was like, that'll work. <laughs> that'll do. <laughs> yeah. It looks nice and simple too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I quite like the uh, the idea of the Z order curve. Just the idea of bit interleaving of the two integers, which is basically mm -hmm. what that does. Um, yeah, that I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, it's neat. It's just. I don't know, sometimes it takes a little bit to calculate that. And yeah, I was yeah, having yeah. fun with bit shifting <laughs> operations in some points. <laughs> because like the way 
so it's uh, is doing the way that it sets neighbors between two cells is it you give it the direction of the neighbor so it sets a cell has a neighbor in that direction and then it also sets that neighbor's cell like it does the same operation in reverse for the neighbor and it does that by bit shifting it or by a bitwise <laughs> operation to go back and forth between the two because those directions are like <laughs> zero and one represent both ways for x one or two and three represent y and four <laughs> and five is it so zero one two three four yeah four and five are z like opposite <laughs> directions so you can just switch back and forth between them using <laughs> bit operations <laughs> Yeah, I was just having fun with bitwise stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it gets like, it's crazy all the little things you can do with them. Like, oh, I want to, you know, get powers of two really fast. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally or, cool. Yeah. Oh, cool. Why is my... I, I, I got to run, actually. Yeah, no worries. I just yeah, do... <laughs> so I will, um, I'll get an oak tree and Get, uh, show you the read-in from UBC to the um, SIMPEG format. I'll get Mike to send you an example. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we can support you with? Um, yeah, what do you need from us? <laughs> uh, I don't know, as long as, I feel like as long as the tree mesh itself is in a stable, look, like not too many people are pushing on it, I can mimic basically all the operations so it should just go right in. Yeah, I don't think you know anybody's I mean? really doing much with it at the moment. Yeah. So the only um, um, the one thing that I think we're we might have a bug in is um, the X naught, which is pretty that should be easy to fix. Um, but I don't think we were actually correctly referencing the location of the origin. Mm -hmm. so, and then I guess I, I guess do you ever want to build a tree in a way that's not balanced? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. So it should just automatically balance itself every time it's created. I yeah. think that's reasonable. Okay. I get that, yeah, that was my other question. Because if not, like, why, why put the option in there for it to be unbalanced? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> All of the things. Yeah. That's super cool. Excellent. So, how do you how do you want to go forward on this? I know that like Lindsay and I were talking about making a writing a paper at, at some point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I had looked through the paper, so it's like I know it, that talks a lot about the z ordering and interleaving and how you guys are indexing all the like the different levels of cells, right? Well, then we just delete that part. <laughs> 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 I know. And, <laughs> and talk about canter repairing and crap like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's been a long time since I've actually uh, looked at that bit. Um, okay. I mean, I, it, would, is that something you'd be interested in, in? Yeah. But like, it, it's not, I don't feel like it's quite, like the whole implementation thing is quite at, like where it is to ready to be plop into Simpeg right now or discretize or whatever, right? There's things that we got to mess with. Like I said, the whole, or just variable widths for cells. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, but keeping that in mind, I think like, um, it's nice to have a place where we'll document and get this published and we can yeah. sort of add bits and pieces as it makes sense and then push on it when it's when it's ready yeah cool. and then yeah writing about some of the clever things that you were doing about the uh um whatever face sorry read that uh, the deflation matrices recursive deflation matrices uh -huh. um, which i think are actually pretty slick yeah it was just kind of it was an easy way to not have to think about it right yeah. yeah. Awesome. And and I other than that, I think I get everything ordered the same way as you guys have it. So it's like every the way that the nodes are ordered around cells are all the same. Okay. That's um, 
That's nice. <laughs> edges are all the same. Yeah. I think the faces are ordered the same. I don't know. Um, yeah. Super cool. Cool, cool. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah, sure. Uh, what, uh, are there, I guess there's the inner product matrices, which should be like relatively simple to do. Yeah, I haven't once, thought about uh, them. Are, are they, I mean, I, have, I guess I haven't looked too much at them as well. So right now I've got it implemented. The way of calling it from Python is I'm just, I have a like an, like a Python class it actually inherits base tensor mesh for now just to mm -hmm. just to get all of the random operations that I haven't defined yet or that I don't need to define. So it's like there's a Cython class and then there's a Python class that inherits that Cython class that you would use. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it should be relatively straightforward. Uh, and you can look at the discretize up to or whatever. Oops pre-mesh sort of things. Oh, actually, they're defined somewhere else anyway, so it should be fine. OK, well, that's about all I get. <laughs> <laughs> really, really cool, man. No kidding. Awesome. Well, you guys enjoy your evening, and yeah. um, we'll keep in touch. No big plans. <laughs> no, no big plans. Too much. Yeah. <laughs> you? So. Cool. Okay. All right. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll chat soon. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Cool. All right. Bye-bye. Sure. Bye. Bye.